The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, and we'll just read again the first two verses. That's the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, and we'll just read the first two verses. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and he taught them saying do you want to hear a perfect sermon by the perfect preacher just carry on reading chapters 5, 6 and 7 the perfect preacher is preaching He's preached a perfect sermon. Have you read it? How many of you here have read that sermon? Are you saved? You've heard the perfect sermon from the perfect preacher. Are you saved? Do you know one of the um, astonishing things about this Sermon on the Mount. It seems that nothing recorded that anyone was ever saved through it. It seems there wasn't a convert after this sermon. I'm talking about during the time of Christ. And of course I am talking about what's recorded. Praise be to God. Many have subsequently, even in this century, put it to their account that they've been blessed through it. But at the time, how do you judge a good sermon? How do you judge a good preacher? I say, would you like to hear I say a preach? He's got the biggest book in the Bible, hasn't he? The longest book in the Bible. God's chosen them to give to put the largest book in the Bible, the largest prophecy, I should say. What has he to say at the end? Chapter 53, verse 1. Who has believed our report? He struggled. He struggled to get anyone. To believe what he said. Or Jeremiah. Was he a successful prophet? Jeremiah? Was he? Read chapter 7 verse 27. Do you know what you'll find God saying to him there? You'll find God saying to Jeremiah. You go and preach my word. But listen. Listen. You won't have any converts. Chapter 7, verse 27, Jeremiah. They won't listen to you, Jeremiah. Can you hear him? Oh, what's the point in going? No one's going to listen to you. What's the point? God is glorified when the gospel is preached. Whether people are saved or not. Whether people believe it or not. God is glorified by the gospel going out. You don't count numbers. If you want to know, has this sermon pleased God? Do you want... Do you want some teaching on true spirituality? 
Do you want an expression of divine light from heaven? Revelation. Do you want, do you want a touch of, of genuine spiritual life? Well, read on. Well, read on. This is where you get it. The perfect sermon from the perfect preacher. You know, we've got to ask today, why are so many books written? Why are so many sermons preached? Why indeed are there so many colleges and seminaries devoted to the teaching of Christ? There's more colleges and seminaries being built to teach the teachings of Christ than anything else in the world. There's, there's, there's power here, you know. Why? Why are there more books on Christ's teaching than anything else? Because his teachings, his message, his word is relevant for every age. Don't you ever believe anyone who says this book's out of date. I tell you, this book's old. Very old. It's the oldest book in the world. Not one minute out of date. Get the difference. Old, yes. Old-fashioned, never. Always relevant. But I'll tell you something else. When you read the word of God, when you listen to the teaching of Christ, there's power in it. It's not just a good message. There's power in it. Transforming, life-changing power in the scriptures. Well worth studying. You know, I remember I, I, I had an elder and uh, he told me a story about A.W. Pink, who I'm sure you all know or heard of. He wrote these monthly studies of the scriptures. And he told me he remembered him coming into his office when he worked in the harbour there. And he remembered Pink coming in with a parcel of the studies of scriptures. And he placed them down on the counter and he said to him, These are the studies for this month. And remember, young man, that's exactly what they are. Studies. The word of God is not meant to be read. It's meant to be studied. There's life changing power in the scriptures. Well, here's Christ. He's teaching. He's preaching. People often ask, now, can you tell me, you read the two verses of our, our text, the two verses we read. Seeing the crowd, he went up and taught the disciples. And people say, tell me, oh, was the sermon on the mount to the multitude, to the crowds, or was it to the disciples? Which? Well, it seems to me it's, it's perfectly clear, actually. He taught the disciples in the company of the crowd. He was teaching them. But every now and again, as it were, you can see the Savior, can't you? Every now and again he's teaching the disciples. But then he turns to the masses and says, Strive to enter in at the narrow gate. You see, the crowds followed Jesus as long as he was performing miracles. As long as he was performing miracles, they followed. They were keen. They were interested. But you see, the deeper he got with his message, slowly 
they began to leave and leave. Until eventually, he said to how many? Twelve. Will you also go away? No one can identify with dwindling congregations more than Christ. He knows what it's like for crowds to follow and then to drift away. You think of this congregation, Jews and Gentiles. The Jews at this particular moment in time of history, there was a lot of skepticism uh, around. There was a lot of disillusionment around. You see, well, there was no Messiah. After 4,000 years, no Messiah. God, I mean, 4,000 years, that, that's quite a long time for any God to keep his promises, you might say. And they were beginning to get, well, well, I wonder, I wonder, did we hear correctly? And not just the 4,000 years wait since the first promise in the Garden of Eden, but for these Jews, it was just at the end of that period known by historians as the 400 year silence the 400 year silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament and so they were very sceptical they were very uh, there was a disillusionment coming in even amongst the Jews with regard to the, the Gentiles well they were very, very suspicious. There were so many false prophets around. Uh, they just didn't know who to believe, didn't know who to trust. And you'd say, well, this, this, this crowd, you're, you're wasting your time preaching to them. But let's move on to the message, to the sermon itself. Now, it's absolutely vital that we grasp this. The Sermon on the Mount is not a sermon on how to obtain salvation. Are you here this morning and you want to know how to be saved? My friend, you don't need a sermon. Repent and believe and you'll be saved instantly. There's no need for a sermon. It's the only message for unsaved people. Repent and believe. That's all. That's all. You say, I can hardly believe that. That's precisely the problem. You don't believe it. Christ has come to me for salvation. Give yourself to me for salvation. And all will be forgiven if you come to me, if you repent of your sinfulness and sinnership and come to me, all is forgiven. Just believe. That's how to be saved. There's no need for a long sermon. What Jesus is teaching here is how, giving the, the Sermon on the Mount is a description of how disciples should live actually therefore it's a description of how everyone should live there's no two different laws on how to live there's just the one way to live but only the disciples will listen intently but it's the same message for others really Now, you all know, I'm sure, that this Sermon on the Mount begins with um, that wonderful uh, passage known as the Beatitudes. Now, what do Beatitudes, what what's a Beatitude? 
Well, beatitude just means the blessings. And as you know, they all begin, blessed are the poor, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, and so on. The blessings. Now, isn't it, isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful? Here's the Jews, who, the disciples, and what was the last word they heard from heaven? We've already indicated it was just at the end of what's called the 400 year silence. Between the two testaments, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there was 400 years and there was not a prophet from God. Malachi is the last prophet. And there's not another prophet at all. You can see John the Baptist just before introducing Christ, you might say. The 400 year silence. What's the last word from God? What's the last word that God spoke from heaven through Malachi? It's the last word of the Old Testament. Do you know what it is? The last word of the Old Testament? The last word from heaven? Curse. The authorised version has it lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Or as it is in your version, very well put, unless I strike with a decree of utter destruction. It's the last word from heaven. Can you imagine the despair of the Jews? Isn't it, on the other hand, isn't it so like Christ? Just when you're expecting the curse to come down, what happens? Christ comes and says, what's his first word? Blessed. Isn't that like Christ, so like Jesus? We deserve the curse and we're waiting for utter destruction to come down upon us. And who steps into the picture? Jesus, the Son of God. And what does he say? Blessed, blessed, blessed. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that the gospel? Isn't that the gospel? Can I ask you a question? What's your definition of blessedness? Just think for a minute. What would you, what's your definition of blessedness? A trouble-free life? No worries? Luxury? Ease? Comfort? Oh, I forgot. Plenty money. For God, plenty money. Blessedness. What's your definition of blessedness? Just in passing, do you know what the devil will say to you? He'll say something that lists to you. I can give you anything you want. Anything you want. Just name it. Just name it. I'll give you anything you want. You follow me. You listen to me. I'll give you what you want. Is that blessedness? That's Satan's definition of happiness. Anything you want. And he says he'll give it to you. But he's a liar. He's the arch deceiver of souls and the father of lies. So, what is real blessedness? Well, blessedness is quite different from happiness. Happiness is dependent upon circumstances. I 
lose my job. I lose, I'm, I'm, I'm paid off, I lose my job. Oh, I'm not happy. I'm not happy, I've lost my job. Oh, but I got another job, far better. Oh, I'm up in the clouds. And guess what? The, company, the new company I've joined goes bust. Oh, I'm down in the dumps again. Happiness is dependent upon your circumstances. You don't want happiness, friend. You want blessedness. That's what you want. That's what you need. That's what we all need. Blessedness. You see, happiness is a feeling. You know? Now, I'm not going to labor this point, but my friend, this world has plenty of ways to make you feel happy. I don't need to even name them. You can take tablets. You can take drink. It'll make you feel happy. Oh, my friend, that's not what you want. You don't want feelings. You want reality. You want blessedness. Blessedness is a state and a condition irrespective of circumstances. So that although I lose my job, although I'm not feeling very well, I am still in this state and condition of blessedness. Blessedness is a state or condition that is not movable, unchangeable, irrespective of what's, of what's happening all around me. Blessedness refers to my whole being. Blessedness is something deep in my soul, something thorough throughout me. <clears throat> Blessedness is a spiritual, it focuses on, on the spiritual and it spreads to the whole person. And something else very, very important. Blessedness is long term. Now just think about it logically. Any blessedness that is short term isn't really blessedness. It's, it's only for a wee while. It's going to end in tragedy. By definition, blessedness has to be long term you know the wonderful news about the gospel about what Christ can give you his blessedness is forever and ever and ever his blessedness is forever doesn't matter what happens around you doesn't matter what happens to you we're not saying these things are not important, but they don't alter your state and condition of blessedness. It is, to put it another way, a relationship with God. And whatever happens to you, you've still got a relationship. You've got a relationship of peace with God. You've got this inner peace that no circumstance can alter or change. You know, the gospel this morning is Christ can give you that blessedness forever and ever and ever. There is in it, and you pick this up from the Beatitudes, it involves also true blessed, a sense of belonging. There are poor souls here who are longing to belong. Well, the gospel. Christ is the answer. Belong. Did you, did you notice? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? Because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn. 
the other more blessed? Eh, you've been miserable, aren't they? Why are they blessed? Because there they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall be comforted. You see, all these prepositions in the original, they're emphatic. They're in capital letters. They're in bold type font, as it were. This is Christ saying, look, I tell you, these are the blessed people. You may not think so. It may not look like it. But I tell you, the kingdom of heaven belongs to them and them only. Theirs is the kingdom. You look at them on earth and say, oh, poor, miserable people. I couldn't go to church like them. I couldn't read the Bible. I couldn't pray like them. He says, I tell you, they're blessed. Blessedness is experiencing peace, joy, hope, love in the middle of trouble. In the middle of trouble. When things around you are collapsing. But you've got God. You've got Christ. And you've got peace. You've got love. Joy. Hope in your soul. You're not affected by it. Let's just touch on one or two. The first two or three of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs. He says, I tell you, you want to belong? The kingdom of heaven belongs to you if you know what it is to be poor in spirit. Do you know that? Do you know what it is to be poor in spirit? What is it? To be poor in spirit is to know what it is to be spiritually bankrupt before God. It's to truthfully go to God and to say to God, I have nothing, I can do nothing, I am nothing before you. I'm spiritually bankrupt. <laughs> there's something else there's something else in being poor in spirit that's very important it is this being conscious you see I, we could say hey wait a minute everybody in the world is spiritually bankrupt and they are they're all spiritually bankrupt but Jesus is referring here in the first place to those who are conscious of their spiritual bankruptcy before God. Conscious of it, aware of it, plagued by it, might I say. But to go on to the other element and be poor in spirit, it's not just being aware of spiritual bankruptcy. This word translated poor in spirit here, it's the word uh, the Greek, taken from the Greek word to beg. It, it's actually the word used for a beggar. Have you got it? Have you latched onto it? Does your awareness of your spiritual bankruptcy lead you to beg of God? Are you a beggar? Do you know what it is to beg? It's to go to God. You know, people get confused about what begging is. I used to think, well, you run out of your pay on Wednesday. And you say to your friend, look, lend us £20 on Friday till I get my pay. That's not begging. You're going to give it them back on Friday when you get your pay. It's not begging. That's borrowing. Do you know what it is to beg? 
is to ask something for nothing. You have nothing. You can do nothing. You are nothing. But can you beg? Can you beg? Can you say to God, I am nothing, I can do nothing, I have nothing, but will you forgive me? Will you take me to heaven for nothing? I can never pay you back. Never. Can you identify with that? Well, Jesus says to you, I tell you, the kingdom of heaven belongs to you. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Emphatic. Theirs. You might think so. They don't look like it. But the kingdom of heaven, I tell you, belongs to them. They're poor in spirit. And they know how to beg. I've often said it and I hope I won't tire saying it. Just call your behavior sin. And all can be forgiven in one moment. Just call it sin. God forgives sin. You've got to be able to say to God, Lord, forgive me for nothing. I can never pay you back. Never. We'll just touch on the second beatitude. Blessed are those who mourn. Again, this is not specifically applied to those who are bereaved, although those who are, we can apply it to them, but it's not directed, it's not referring directly to them. It's those who are mourning for two things. Mourning over what we already said, their sin. Mourning over their sin. What kind of person are you? Do you know you've sinned? What do you say about it? Oh, well, I'm only human. I'm only human. No problem, get on my life. Or does it trouble you? Does it trouble you that you're a sinner? Do you mourn over it? Do you grieve over it? But when Christ speaks about blessed are those who mourn here, it's not simply those mourning over sin. It's those who mourn over something else. And you'll find it again in the Old Testament. Not quite the last prophet, but the second last, Zechariah. Zechariah. Those who mourn over him that was pierced. In that day, there'll be a mourning. Mourning over him that was pierced. A reference to Christ. You mourn that there had to be that there was had to be piercing. If you're not going to pay for your sins, someone else must pay for your sin. You mourn, secondly, over the fact that it was him, Christ, that had to be pierced. As the children say. There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gates of heaven and let us in. You mourn over the fact that there had to be piercing. You mourn over the fact that it was him that had to be pierced. And thirdly, you mourn over the fact that it was your sins which pierced him. These four soldiers that nailed him to the cross, they were only the agents. It was our sins, the sins of believers, that really nailed him to the cross. They mourn over the fact that they pierced him. And Christ says to them, I tell you, Blessed are those who mourn for such things, for they, they shall be comforted. Well, as we close, one, one basic point. 
blessedness can only be found in a person. You can't find it in a religion, in the last analysis. You can't find it in a ritual. You can only find it in a person. You can only find it in Christ. And in the gospel, he comes to you this morning. This morning, And he says, come to me. Whatever your problems, whatever your difficulty, whatever your sin, whatever your feeling, come to me. I will give you rest. May God, the Holy Spirit, make his word effectual to every one of us. Let's bow bow our heads in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would take the things of Christ and make them ours. We pray that you would bless us now with saving faith in Jesus. Unite us to him in a living faith, we pray. For we pray only in Christ's name. Amen.